Mike, specifically, what do you guys like about Sirola and Wells? Both of these guys, uh, bo <clears throat> both these guys fit an attractive archetype as strike throwing starting pitchers with the deep repertoire. Um, in both cases, we have excellent performance and a very appealing pitch mix. So for us to roller, we were attracted to the four pitch mix. It's a good fastball, good traits, and flashes of power. Uh, he leverages the curveball downhill, throws a slider for strikes and for chases, and he can get a lot of awkward swings on a plus splitter. So he brings a lot, a lot to the table. Um, Tyler Wells is an interesting case. There are some similarities to Sir Roller in that um, we're drawn to the full assortment of weapons he has in his bag, both for lefties and, and for righties. He's a 6'8 monster. Um, he's a starter who works all four quadrants of the zone with the fastball. He features two interesting breaking balls and a plus changeup. He executes them well and throws them for strikes. For him, he missed the 2019 season. He had elbow reconstruction in May uh, 2019. So 2020 would have been largely a lost season for him anyway. And in that respect, the shutdown probably wasn't as detrimental to him as it might have been uh, for the development of some other players. So with both these guys, um, we're excited for the chance just to acquire two starting pitchers who feature an impressive combination of bat missing ability and a proclivity for throwing strikes. Dan Connolly, you're up next. Hey, Mike, this is a, it's kind of interesting because you mentioned Wells and the Tommy John surgery, um, and you guys took a chance on him. The flip side has been done with Zach Pop, uh, you know, a, a guy who did not pitch this year because of that. Um, were you surprised that Pop and Fenter went? Um, and how much how much debate was there on Pop specifically? Because we know his talent, but obviously, like Wells, he's coming back from injury. Yeah, it's unfortunate both those guys were taken. Uh, they both have good potential. We talked about both of them. We talked about others. Um, you know, it's I, this is really a testament to to having a deep system. We added six prospects in the off season. We added a seventh at the end of the regular season in Bruce Zimmerman. So ultimately. We can't protect them all. Um, it's a positive in that we're making strides that this is a relevant topic of conversation right now. And we'll be rooting for them, but we'll also cross our fingers and hope that the teams who selected them, that they're not able to carry them all season and that we can get them back at some point in 2021. Yeah, just what was attractive about these three players in the minor league phase? Okay, sounds good. Um, well, first of all, I, um, I think we're happy to add three guys. It's kind of along the same theme of we're just trying to add as much talent as possible, and we're really excited about these three guys. I think it, it was a deeper than normal uh, minor league phase of the draft. We had a lot of names. Um, uh, obviously, we picked three, and a lot of the names we were on were taken ahead of us in, this, in our second pick. So, um, uh, in particular with these three guys, all three of them, we, we're going to have a chance to develop them. They all three are under control for at least three years, where sometimes you can pick a guy and only have them for one season. Um, Ricky Ramirez was the first guy, a reliever. Uh, really, the, the thing that stood out, he's had good performance, but we just had him with a really good fastball and slider. Um, and those pitch uh, grades, you know, stood out. And uh, we feel like um, you know, that's going to give him his best chance and, and we'll have a chance to continue to develop him. In Hudgens' case, the catcher, a really good defensive catcher with above average arm. We've got him at least a 60 or above arm, 38% caught stealing. Really good, uh, hits the ball hard, really good batted ball data for Hudgens. And uh, uh, anytime we can add catching and add, uh, you know, kind of our overall catching depth, we thought that was a, a plus. And then with Ignacio Feliz, um, a younger right-handed starter, a um, uh, kid that's already been traded for major league talent. Um, so he's got a lot of upside. Um, he's got a four-pitch mix. Uh, probably the fastball, curveball, and the split are the most interesting. Uh, but a, a starting pitcher that's only pitched at the complex level in the short season that we think uh, 
you know, we can continue to develop. Steve Molesky, if you'd like to ask Kent your question. Ken, just a technical question. Is it now that each team can only protect 38 Rule 5 eligible players in the minor league phase? And also, what is the dollar value that you have to send to the other teams on the minor league guys? So, yeah, that's correct. So the, your AAA roster, 38 is the maximum number. We started the, uh, the day at 36. And then we lost two, um, so we we had a chance to potentially make four picks there, but we we protected uh, 30, 36 of the thirty eight, and then the dollar value is twenty four thousand dollars on the minor league players that are selected. Stan Charles, your question for Kent. Hey Kent, my question was going to go to Mike, but you've been around long enough under Dan to to handle this. Um, of the four pitchers, the two we picked up. And the two we lost, three of them have had pretty serious arm problems. Is that pretty much routine? That's who you're going to get out of the Rule 5 draft a lot of times is somebody that is coming back from significant arm problems? I don't know if I would call it routine, but it is um, it is to be expected to some degree. Um, I think to some degree, people look at uh, Tommy John as if you can get it out of the way earlier in your career. Sometimes those guys come back better um, after Tommy John. Um, they they take better care of their arm, have more of a regimented uh, program. Um, but I, I wouldn't say it's the norm, but um, I think it just, you know, uh, obviously it's the case uh, today and a couple of the pitchers that we lost and were taken. One other question for Kent from David Loria. Go ahead, David. Hey, Kent, this is more general in scope, and it could apply to both the, the big league or the minor league phase, which is just how predictable or unpredictable is the Rule 5 draft? Do you have a pretty good idea of who's going to go? And, uh, you know, just how many surprises are there in a typical year? I don't think there's that many surprises. I mean, I think most clubs know who their bubble guys are. Um, in, in our case, like Mike Snyder mentioned, we spent a lot of time talking about Pop and Finter and others. Um, so, we, you know, we obviously knew it was a possibility, but the, the deeper your farm system is and the stronger your organization is, um, I think you see, um, you know, more players typically taken from those clubs. Right, and uh, presumably clubs have a draft board, much as they do in the amateur draft. Uh, do the players generally go in a predictable order, or is it far more unpredictable than an amateur draft? I think it's pretty similar. There, sometimes there's a player that's kind of taken higher than you think he would go, but but in general, you know, a lot of the names that we were talking about on both phases were taken today. So I, I think we're on the right guys, uh, the right group of guys, and, um, you know, we're happy with the players we were able to select. Thank you. All right, we'll go back to uh, Dan Conley for your question for Mike Snyder. Actually, I already asked it, Adam, but uh, but I, I do have a, a just a technical one since you know I don't want to I'm, I'm here. Um, you, I, you guys have have selected three before um, in, in the past. Was that it was it was strange because it seemed like it cut off after the second round. Was it only going to be two rounds this year? Did they come back and ask you guys about a third? Was the third not on the uh, uh, table for you guys? It just seemed kind of weird the way it was. And I wasn't sure if that's a rule change or if that was just a glitch this year. So these were the two players that, that we had targeted. Um, you're also you're limited to however many players are you're limited to 40 on your 40 man roster. So for us in particular. Um, that was our limit. Uh, this is a, this is kind of a, a, um, always a kind of rite of passage in Baltimore in the rule five, but, uh, I think the league, that's probably just a, a, uh, factor where everybody is either at 40 already or has decided to pass at that point. I think it's not as common for most teams to be picking even two, uh, certainly not three. Yeah, I had forgotten about that third, that 40, that's why. Because they didn't come back to you guys and ask you, but that's because you guys already hit 40 at that point. Right. Rich Dubroff, do you have a question for Mike? Yeah, uh, 
did you talk to Ben McDonald about uh, about Scroller and what uh, what his opinions were of his uh, of his nephew? Yeah, you know, you always have to be careful with players in other organizations. So I guess I'd say regardless of the family connection, we would have made the pick either way. And um, I mean, that said, anytime there's there's big league bloodlines, it's it's it does give us comfort that the player has maybe a little bit better feel for what to expect, how to carry himself, uh, what it takes to succeed at the big league level. Nathan Ruiz, you're up. Hey, Mike, how did you guys go about evaluating these players, just given the, the lack of a 2020 season? Obviously, in Wells' case, like you mentioned, he wouldn't have pitched anyway, but just how did you – was it just relying on a, a lot on past information? Just what was the process there? Evaluating players in this environment, it's been a constant battle, I'll tell you that. Um, that's, that applies to Rule 5, that applies to free agency, that applies to all our trades throughout the past year. Um, like you said, if you're hunting for a silver lining, uh, you know, with Wells, he probably would have lost, everybody lost development time. And for him, it was rehab. Um, and for us, we do feel we're probably a little bit better situated for this type of player evaluation compared to other MLB clubs, just given how efficient we feel we are operating off of, of video and data. Um, but it is a challenge, there's, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, having our live looks of minor league players limited to instructional league games only, there's definitely important parts of the puzzle that you miss. Um, we've been baking in greater variability. Uh, next season, I'd anticipate um, we're probably going to be surprised more often than we are in a normal year uh, where players might make a positive leap that the league as a whole didn't necessarily see signals of ahead of time. So that might be particularly true on the pitching end with a full season of, of pitch design, and strength work that's largely out of the public eye. We've, we've been proactive as much as we can, contacting facilities, trying to get data, trying to get video and in-person reports as much as we can just to, to narrow that gap a little bit. Joe Treza, you're up. Yeah, Mike, just for clarification, um, is, is Wells expected to be fully healthy for spring training? We expect so, but there's always vagaries in this. So I think we're going to find out a lot when he reports to spring training and in the next uh, several months as we, as we get our hands on him. Uh, time for a couple more questions. Stan, go ahead. Mike, um, just a question. If, if either Fent or, or Pop, becomes available to the club again, would they be likely to pick them up if they don't stay in the majors? I think we would certainly welcome them back with open arms and we will, uh, yeah, we'll cross our fingers, hope that it happens. Um, I think it, you know, it's always a challenge for us and for any team to keep these players on the roster all season. So that obviously weighs into to our decision and, um, and other teams making these picks. But we would certainly like to have them. 